part of our, our practice that we're pretty into is this idea that you don't you want to get better at playing the game. Uh, you don't want to get better at playing the drill. And, and I think when you have this enormous body of drills and you're doing different drills on different days and everything like that, then your athletes are trying to learn how the drill goes rather than how to play the game. And that's, that's pretty detrimental to learning as well. Um, and what's the, what's, what's the great quote? Boredom is found in the endless pursuit of novelty. Um, and, and that's what happens when you start collecting all of these drills. And if you think some specific drill is gonna help you get better at playing the game, it's not true. The game is gonna get, get you better at playing, playing the game. Welcome to the Coaches Club Podcast, powered by Transform Sport, where we believe great coaches transform lives, athletes deserve great coaches, and coaches deserve great training. I'm your host, Luke Gromer, and every week we're bringing you conversations with coaches and leaders in sport that will help you grow as an effective teacher and transformational leader so that you and your team can reach your potential. Coaches, I'm excited to welcome Coach Jason Watson to the podcast. Coach Watson is the head coach of the University of Arkansas's women's volleyball team, and he has over 15 years of head coaching experience at the Division I level and another 11 years as an assistant. He also played at BYU, where he was a four-year starter, two-time captain, and an All-American. In this episode, we talk about his evolution as a coach, delivering effective feedback, how to be both good to and good for our athletes, his quest to plan really good practices, and the importance of how coaches respond to errors. One personal note about this conversation. I've been fortunate to have a lot of conversations with coaches in the past year, And this one in particular is one of the conversations that's impacted me the most. I really think you're going to enjoy it. And if you do enjoy it, I'd really appreciate it if you took a minute to either leave a rating and review wherever you listen to the podcast or give us a shout out on Twitter. As always, you can get a free copy of the podcast notes. I took eight pages of notes on this episode. And to get that free PDF, go to coachesclubpod.com. And one final thing before we hop in. We just kicked off the second round of free virtual book clubs covering the Coach's Guide to Teaching last week. You can get a sneak peek into the book clubs in bonus episodes 2 and 3, which also include a guest appearance in Q&A with Doug Lamov. If you want to learn more or sign up for the next round of book clubs, go to cgtbookclubs.com or click the link in the show details. Now to my conversation with Coach Jason Watson. Enjoy the episode. All right, coach is really excited to welcome Coach Jason Watson to the podcast today. Uh, coach Watson is the head coach for the University of Arkansas's women's volleyball team. Uh, coach Watson, here's my first question for you. I would love to know a couple of the biggest areas in which you feel like you've changed most significantly in your coaching from when you first started until where you are now. Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, I hope the answer is that I'm much better than I was. Um, uh, I feel like there's at times a reluctance to uh, grow and learn in, in this profession. And uh, I hope I don't fall into that, that trap. Um, when I think about that, um, you know, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, one is as I've gotten older, I think I've gotten more patient. And uh, perhaps with that, a little bit uh, more understanding and probably enormously more empathetic to the student athletes that I, that I coach. Um, as my own children got older and I started coaching uh, kids the same age as mine, uh, it was a really, really eye-opening thing to just uh, listen to their experience as they've gone through their respective athletic careers and, and, uh, you know, just how much, uh, the relationships they have with their coaches can be good and, and not so great. So that's, uh, that's been a part that I've really struggled to, uh, you know, embrace and to get better at is just be patient and, and empathetic. Um, uh, with that, I, I think I also have moved away from this kind of stat driven, um, uh, way of measuring performance. I think we still measure it, but um, 
but we don't use it to motivate as much as we had been before where we look at uh, numbers and um, hey, you have to be better at this and this and this and these statistical categories that uh, we need to do. We, we take these numbers so that we, uh, I think are running good practices so we know where we should be spending our time, but uh, we don't use them as much to motivate as we once did. So I think that's been a, an evolution. Um, so rather than to motivate, uh, hey, let's find some ways to help these athletes be better rather than just show them these outcome-based numbers. Um, and then I think the other thing is, is practices. Um, I'm, I'm on this quest right now to write uh, really good practices and, and what does that look like? And so I think the practices that I write now and, and under that umbrella of practices comes feedback and reps and things like that. But the practices that I write now and my behavior in those practices is much different than it was when I was, uh, was first running practices and, and coaching, I think. Uh, I think I'm less a play-by-play -play person in practice where I'm, you know, continually, you know, providing all of this, you know, meaningless feedback. It's just noise. To now, you know, writing these practices, uh, we want to play as much volleyball as we can in practice, putting in some constraints around what it is that we're working on, um, trying to get our athletes to, you know, implicitly see what it is or maybe make some connections themselves rather than, uh, than me telling them or our assistants telling them. Um, and, um, and, and then, you know, perhaps uh, my role isn't to, to provide all of this traditional feedback that we, we would that's outcome-based, but to ask questions and allow my athletes to kind of make connections on their own and find some solutions on their, on their own. So, um, and that's really hard, actually. I think it's really hard. I think it's a really hard evolution, uh, at least for me. But uh, yeah, I think those three things. I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not done, <laughs> you know, uh, but, um, but, but trying to get better at those three things. Yeah. And those are really, those are really powerful things. And I want to talk a little bit more about all three, but first let's talk a little bit more about your practices and how those have changed. Maybe just share a little bit more about how your feedback has evolved from, yeah, like you talked about earlier in your career until now, and maybe like how have, what, what have you put in place or what has been the most helpful for you in growing in your effectiveness when you're giving feedback? So uh, one of the things that, that has happened is that we video uh, all of our practices and, and there's an analytics component to that, that, that occurs daily. And, and so we watch a lot of film. Um, and, and part of that film is, you know, you get to watch yourself as a coach. Uh, you're not mic'd up, but you get to watch yourself as a coach and you get to, and Without fail, as I'm watching practice, I think to myself, will you just shut up and let them play? My goodness, how long is it going to take you to, to talk to them about this kind of thing? And, and the longer you're talking, you know, it's like, okay, there's uh, one less rep, there's one less rep, there's one less rep, one, and you, you add that up over the course of the season. And you, you become rep deficient really quickly because you're trying to coach, you know, you're trying to provide this, you know, this almost Disney movie approach to coaching, you know, like, you know, um, and, um, and so the game provides an enormous amount of feedback in and of itself. You know, it doesn't always need you to provide uh, these outcome based feedback, you know, Hey, you hit that ball out of bounds, you know, Okay, thanks, coach. I already know that sort of thing, you know. But but the feedback for me, uh, the, providing feedback for me now, is, is more based on okay, what was it that you saw, and what is it that you were trying to do in that in that situation? Oh, okay, that that makes sense. All right, hey, we just missed. All right, let's go back at it, and that's the length of the feedback. Um, and uh, or hey, how about hey, here might be a different solution. Uh, to the same problem. Hey, have you thought about this solution? You know, and um, and this idea of toolbox now has become pretty rampant in the coaching. You know, hey, right tool for the right job, sort of thing. Um, and you want to give your athletes uh, the best possible toolbox you can. Um, 
And I think that's to some degree right, but I think you want to make the connection between the tool and the job. Um, you know, what is the job and what is the tool? So that's where we spend most of our time. And it really has just come from me being absolutely frustrated in watching myself coach on a daily basis. Um, and just, hey, there's got to be a better way to, to do this. So um, so that's the nature of the feedback. And, and probably a little bit of my feedback now is more relationship based. Like how are we going to talk to each other? You know, how is it that we're going to communicate with each other? Uh, how is it that we can foster these relationships in a pretty competitive environment? Not only are we competing against uh, opponents, but we're competing against each other. And the rising tide is rising all ships, so to see. And so how is it that we can continue to, uh, you know, be good teammates in a pretty competitive environment and be able to communicate uh, with, with each other in that environment? So I'm spending a lot more time on that than it is, hey, this is how your platform should be. This is how your, your hand should be. You know, most of them have got some rudimentary skills at this level where, you know, you're not really into developing or refining skills. Yeah, a little bit, but not to a great degree degree so so yeah that's an interesting evolution that you know i i used to think that practice needed to be this constant verbal feedback on every play that occurred and um and now i i think it's more along the lines of hey just get out of their way you know get out of their way and um and 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 stop talking you know stop talking and get out of their way yeah, that's really good. A couple of things that stood out was one, you talked about asking questions and specifically like perception building questions. Hey, what did you see there? And then, like you said, most of the time they give you an answer and you're like, oh yeah, it makes sense why you attempted to do that. You were maybe looking at the wrong thing. Here's what you should be looking at, like directing their eyes, things like that. So powerful to yeah, speed up that learning and, and just to make sure that we're giving feedback on things that matter, not things that don't, but then I, I would love also for you to talk a little bit more about what you just talked about with the relationship piece and the feedback. And you mentioned at the beginning of my original question, how empathy has become just one of the, the biggest areas that you've evolved in. And so I'd love to know more about that. And I don't know if you have any, any stories that you would want to share about that. I, I just think that that's such a, such a, a key piece of of coaching that we, yeah, consider that and figure out how to get good at those things. Yeah, I, I think it, it stems from, and, um, you know, I played at BYU and I played for uh, a coach by the name of Kyle McGowan, who was um, along with John Kessel, who you've already had on your podcast, um, uh, pretty transformative coaches in our sport in, in, in the United States and probably around the world for that matter. Um, and, um, and so Carl would say this, and I think it's pretty powerful actually, uh, that his job was to be good to and good for the athletes that he coached. And um, I don't know if he came up with that or he stole it from somewhere else. It doesn't, it did, whoever gets credit for it deserves the credit, but it was a remarkable thing. So when we talk about empathy, you know, my, my job is to be good to them and so you want to treat them well and you want to treat them with respect and and um you know and you want to um you know ensure that they feel supported and cared for um you know because when they come into your gym you're putting them in a really uncomfortable situation you know you're asking them perhaps to make changes and along the way they're going to make errors and it's pretty vulnerable you know to to you know, make errors. And, and so you want to be good to them so that they feel comfortable and then they can make these errors and things aren't, aren't going to go, you know, um, you know, they're, they're going to feel safe in that, that environment, you know, and, um, you know, we don't make them run when they make errors and things like that. You know, in our sport, there's always this tendency that, service errors, you know, hey, however many service errors you have, and that's how many run, how many, 
lines you need to run at the end of practice or something like that. And if that fixed service errors, then we wouldn't have to worry about service errors anymore, but it doesn't. And, um, and so it just seems that's a, a silly and waste of time to do that kind of stuff. And it hinders learning, you know, uh, cause now you put a punishment to, to learn. So uh, you want to do that. So you want to be good to them and then you want to be good for them. And when you're good for them, then you need to be better as a coach, you know, you need, they need to know that you're working hard. They need to know that, you know, what you're talking about these days. Um, uh, you know, certainly gone are the days where, you know, the coach is the ultimate authority on knowledge, you know, that's, that's gone. Um, and, and probably it should never existed, but um, so, so that's the case. So in that environment, if you will, um, my job is to make sure that I feel strongly about this, that my job is to make sure that they're also good to and good for each other. And uh, we need to maybe, you know, ensure that they're communicating with themselves, you know, hey, we're not going to talk about, you know, or, you know, you have a, an athlete that's having a hard day in the gym and then they finally make a kill or something like that. And their response is, well, finally, I get it. You know, it's like, no. We're not going to talk about finally. We're going to talk. We're going to celebrate success, and we're not going to to act as in relief. You know, we're going. Hey, yeah, great swing. Now let's let's do it again. Um, and and so we got to make sure that they're saying the right things to themselves. They're incredibly hard on themselves, harder on themselves than I ever will be. And and so we've got to catch them doing things right and celebrate those moments. Um, and then we also need to make sure that their peer to peer relationships are strong and we've got to catch that when things aren't going well and say, okay, how are we going to solve this? How are we going to talk through this? Uh, in, in our program, we, we absolutely respect open and honest, uh, communication. Um, and we take it a step further that, uh, we also, are, our job is to assume positive intent when people are talking to us. And, um, and so I think those things help us create pretty strong relationships and uh, they're being tested in this COVID time. They're being completely tested. And uh, I think we weathered some really, really interesting times because of those two, um, two things. So I spent a lot of time trying to catch people doing things right, not only in the skill, but also in their communication and their relationships. That's really good. And there's a lot of, a lot of good stuff packed into that. I'd love to know a little bit more about how you create a culture of open and honest communication, both between players and between coach and players. You mentioned assuming positive intent. That's just so huge to come in with that. But what else are you doing or how are you creating that culture of open and honest communication? Yeah, it, it means different things to, to people. Open and honest doesn't mean that you just uh, get to say what's ever on your mind. And um, uh, that's not, not, not the way it is. And um, so there's a, you know, there's this great book, The Ideal Team Player, that talks about um, uh, smart and smart. Uh, you want humble, hungry and smart uh, athletes or th those are the traits that make up great teammates. And Smart being not only just intellectually smart, but uh, being, uh, you know, being able to read the room and be able to understand relationships and, and things like that. So, so we want athletes that are smart in, in that way. And not everybody comes into your program with those, those skills. Um, so one of the interesting things that we did this year is we got rid of captains. We just don't have captains. Um, uh, we, because in our sport, it's supposed to be the captain that talks to the officials, but the officials will talk to anybody. So there's no, so being a captain doesn't mean anything, you know, internationally it sure does, but in college, the officials will talk to anybody. And, um, and, and one of the things we decided was that everybody's voice is clearly important in this process. And there shouldn't be some kind of layer of filtering where an athlete goes to the captain and the captain comes to the coaches. That's how it traditionally flows with this uh, flow of information. It's much healthier if the athlete comes straight to me or to an assistant or something, and we get a chance to develop our relationship uh, and, and do that. So, um, and, and that's been pretty interesting actually. 
um, and was really embraced by our team. Um, and, and so there is no perceived pecking order of communication in our, in our gym because everybody's voice is, is important and everybody's, you know, if it's aligned with what we're trying to do, of course, uh, everybody's opinion on what it is we should be doing should be heard and listened to. Uh, and so that was step one of that of that kind of you know creating this open and honest um, dialogue. I, I think I'm I'm lucky that I'm surrounded by really good people that are trustworthy and that are uh, intent on making this a great environment. So I think that that helps. And we talk about trust a lot. Uh, we trust uh, our athletes. We don't micromanage things. Uh, we we try to stay above the fray. Um, I do too. I do certainly. There's only a finite number of things I care about. Um, I'm not all in their business. Um, uh, but um, so I, I think those things help. And uh, in my quest to be patient, I'm, I'm also probably striving to be emotionally balanced. Maybe that's a good term, you know, like I'm not riding this roller coaster of emotion. Um, and uh, if I'm having a bad day, then I kind of give myself a time out before I go into practice. Uh, uh, only because I think, you know, one bad practice by me, you know, ruins months of trust, you know, and, and, and I can't do that. Uh, and so I've got to be emotionally balanced and pretty consistent and, and, and things, you know, you don't want your athletes coming into the gym wondering what kind of mood coach is in today, you know, uh, that, that, that hinders learning too. So, um, so that's kind of where we, we, we start with that sort of thing. Um, I know culture building is a big deal now in the coaching profession. It's become, you know, everybody's talking about culture building um, and things like that. And I get it, you know, you know, what is it? Culture eats talent for lunch or something like that. And, and maybe that's true if you're equally talented. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter how good your culture is if you're a 12s team versus a college team, you're not gonna beat them. You know? uh, but but I, I don't know if we're culture building as we are relationship building. I think that's more to the point that we're trying to do. We're trying to build relationships. And, um, and I, I think with that, you're, you're building relationships every day. Every interaction that you have with your athletes uh, is, is either building or not building those relationships. Yeah, absolutely. That's powerful. A couple of things that really stood out to me were one, you just talking about the importance of coaches staying emotionally balanced. For some reason we've given the coaching profession for the most part, a free pass to act almost however they want. And we would never accept the behaviors that we accept from coaches in other learning environments, but because it's a practice on a court or in a gym or on a field, we think it's okay for the person leading the environment to yeah, act however they want. And, and the thing that is so powerful about what you said is that like it, it destroys trust. It destroys trust with your athletes. And like you talked about, you guys are really about relationship building is trust. It's, it's building trust and trust isn't trust is built in a ton of small moments. Like you talked about. And I just think that the, the importance of what you said just can't be understated that coaches staying emotionally balanced is so, so important to creating a positive learning environment and building those relationships. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, no, no parent would allow their four-year-old to act as some coaches do in the checkout line at Walmart if they don't get a candy, you know, like you just, you wouldn't, you know, if your four-year-old loses their mind in the checkout aisle because you didn't get them a Twix bar, you know, the kid's not going to get a Twix bar and we're leaving Walmart. I mean, it just, but with coaches, it just becomes celebrated, you know, like, oh, that coach is intense, you know, and it's like, uh, okay, okay, fine, you know, but, but, uh, you know, and, and maybe if that's how you are as a coach and you're the same, no matter what, then, then maybe your athletes probably are okay because it's consistent, you know, that that's consistent. But I mean, if I'm, 
emotionally balanced and one day just lose it like a four-year-old in the checkout line, my team's going to be like, whoa, whoa, where did that come from? And um, that's what I'm trying to avoid. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go back to something you mentioned towards the beginning about statistics and analytics. And you said that you moved away from using those as motivators. And so I'd love to know how do you use them now? And then also what are you using to motivate your players? If it's, if it's not those statistics and analytics. Yeah. So I, I think the first part first with, with numbers and, and we have at our disposal, you know, an enormous amount of, of data data that, that, that gets accumulated by us and by third party providers. We have an enormous amount and, um, it's pretty overwhelming, actually. Um, and we're on this quest to make this as simple as we possibly can. You know, we, we value simple over complex. Uh, so we're trying to make things as simple as we possibly can for, for, for everybody involved. So we have this, this data. And what we're trying to do with that is what we're trying to do is write really good practices. So we look at that to make sure that we're in the right forest. Uh, we're in the right forest. Uh, you know, planting or cutting down trees, however you want to finish that, uh, that thought. Um, and, uh, and so that's what we use the numbers for, you know, where are we at? You know, how much time do we need to spend in this specific phase of the game? Uh, and if we do, do we get a good return on it? You know, does that, does that area need to upgrade so that we can, you know, we can win, you know, and, and then how do our practices look, uh, so that we're spending time in that, in that area. You know? And so that's where our numbers come in. And, and that's, that's pretty healthy. We're also on a quest to understand numbers better. Um, you know, uh, numbers, it, it seems like in our sport are just binary outcome numbers. So if you look at hitting efficiency, for example, it's, you know, kills, subtracted errors over total attempts. And for the most part, that accounts for maybe 50% of your hitting. And then there's 50% that is not measured. And um, that's a big part of the game that's not being measured. And, and so we're trying to understand that. Um, I don't have any answers for you, yet, but we're trying to understand that sort of thing. But, you know, traditionally, we'd, we'd share these numbers. Hey, here's where you are. And here's where you are in comparison to the SEC. And here's where your comparison to the, the I don't know, the the... 32 at-large teams and, and so forth and so forth and, and, and so forth. But it was really misleading, you know, because not everybody, you know, you don't play everybody. Um, and uh, in, a, in a case like us at Arkansas, where, you know, we are primarily driven by our outside hitters, um, teams know that, you know, and so if... I'll give you an arbitrary thing. So if if you are preparing to play Arkansas and you want to beat us, you know that you have to stop our outside hitters. Therefore, you spend most of your time trying to defend our outside hitters. And so our outside hitters efficiency is probably going to be a lot less because teams know that they have to go do that. And, uh, and so those skew the numbers considerably. So um, and so I could have two really good outside hitters, which we do right now at Arkansas, but their level of performance is below, could be potentially below the mean. And, and that's such an unfair thing for us to share with them because they're really doing a nice job and they're carrying an enormous load for us. And yeah, they're, they're maybe a little bit below where the mean needs to be. And I don't want them knowing that, you know, I don't, they don't need to know that because they're awesome volleyball players doing a really good job. And all they're going to fixate on is the fact that they're, you know, below the mean if they, if they are in this particular category. So we just don't do that anymore. We don't share that with them. Uh, our end of year meetings with them is, Hey, how did you feel you did? Did you feel like you got better? And where is it that you want to grow as an athlete? And how can I help you get there? now that I know what it wants to do. And it's never anymore about, hey, hey, everybody else in the conference is passing like some, I'm not sure I'm familiar with our stats, but you know, let's say 50% perfect passes and you're at 
45% perfect passes. And the kid's like, oh my gosh, I'm so bad. You know, I'm 5% below, but, but you're passing every ball, you know? And so that's, that's the fundamental difference. So there's so many different ways to interpret. So we just, we just got out of that business. We just didn't think it was a healthy business to be in. Um, and then to motivate them in practice, uh, I think what we just do is we play. We play and we put a score up. And, um, and so we play a lot of sixes. We're going to play more sixes is, is what I'm learning. Uh, and we put a score up. And, uh, and, and so that's motivating. Um, you know, either you're going to win this drill or you're not. And there's no consequence if they lose. You know, the consequence is just losing is losing. And, uh, and losing isn't fun. And, and, you know, so don't lose tomorrow. And all right, off we go. And so that's the motivating thing there is, yeah, we put a score up and uh, let's go play volleyball. And, um, and it turns out that's fairly motivating for lots of people, you know, <laughs> and, um, and uh, yeah, so uh, there's no, I, I think we've used the Disney analogy more than once here, but there's, there's no, you know, there's no Rudy moment in practice where, you know, we, we got this thing going on. It's just, hey, we play and we go. I mean, the only really interesting thing that we do in practice is we have what's called a doubles ladder where um, it's two on two and you sort of play around Robin with everybody on, on that, that court. Um, and if you win, you move up a court. If you lose, you move down a court. And uh, that's pretty motivating because nobody wants to be on the fourth court. And um, so that sets the trend in practice. Then we go play some sixes and we put a score to it and, uh, and, and off we go. And that's that. That's, that's it. Um, pretty simple, actually. Yeah, that's awesome. Just keeping score changes everything. And um, playing the game, like it's why your athletes are there. They're there to play. We should play more. I'd like to know a little bit more about your practice planning process. You've, you've talked about how you're just on this mission to plan and execute really, really great practices. And so one of the things I'm really curious about is what that process is like. And if, are you, are you planning practices like just one day at a time, or are you planning more with a long-term focus? Like maybe it's, you know, I'm also a teacher. So like, are you planning in units almost where it's like these four to six weeks, I know we're going to be hitting these things and then later, or are you going kind of day by day? What's your process for like, what's your process for planning practice? Like, yeah. So I used to have these really detailed practice plans. Um, uh, what is it? The, the four part practice plan. Is that what it is? The four part. Anyway, um, used to have these pretty detailed, they're not as detailed anymore. Um, and uh, part of our, our practice that we're pretty into is this idea that you don't, you want to get better at playing the game. Uh, you don't want to get better at playing the drill. And, and I think when you have this enormous body of drills and you're doing different drills on different days and everything like that, then your athletes are trying to learn how the drill goes rather than how to play the game. And that's, that's pretty detrimental to learning as well. Um, and what's, the, what's, what's the great quote? Boredom is found in the endless pursuit of novelty. Um, and, and that's what happens when you start collecting all of these drills. And if you think some specific drill is going to help you get better at playing the game, it's not true. The game is going to get better. You get you better at playing, playing the game. So, so we just have a handful of drills that our athletes know how they work. Um, and so when we get into these practice planning, we don't have to teach the drill. They already know how to drill. Now, there'll be different changes and subtle changes to the drill, but the basic foundation of the drill remains the same. Um, but we tend to, to have a, a rough staff hey here's some things we want to kind of accomplish this week um and uh but it's not really formally in chunks of units as you would describe them as it's it's probably daily um daily with the understanding that it's not reactive um and so if we go into practice and 
you know, we've identified this is a system we need to get better at. And this other system wasn't great today. We're not reactive to, okay, now we've got to go, you know, we're putting, uh, you know, putting all our fingers in the holes in the dam sort of thing where we're just trying to fix the, the main leak. Um, so that helps a little bit. That helps a little bit. But, yeah, we don't, you know, hey, after two weeks, we should have this system in place. And after two weeks, we should have that system in, in place. Um, mainly because we think, you know, after two weeks, we should be better at playing volleyball. Uh, and, um, and if our practices look like that, then we're really working on any, everything. Maybe with this just limited focus on this type of thing, trying to get our athletes to make some connections rather than us leading them those, those connections in the practice. That's where I think practice playing is hard for me. Um, I, I think, you know, how is it that I can write a practice where we get better at this specific thing without letting our athletes know that's what I really want us to get better at? Um, that That's this interesting connection that I've learned in the last couple of weeks from some people I've talked to. You know, you want them to make those connections rather than you lead them to make those, those connections. That's a really hard thing to do. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to see how we do that in the fall, but that's where we're going with, uh, with our practices planning is, um, yeah, trying to get better at things and allow the athletes to try and make those connections without us leading them to those connections. So, um, I don't know, check back in six months and we'll see how we did. (laughs) I love it. That's awesome. A little bit more on practice and kind of connecting back to some of the things you shared on feedback. I I'm really curious, how do you, how do you align with your staff on feedback? You know, I think it's, we've probably all seen a practice of whatever sport where there's three, four or five coaches and they're all giving feedback on different things. And you mentioned noise earlier that, it can just become noisy and th- we know that hurts learning. And so how do you guys as a staff align and kind of sync up on your feedback so that you can aid learning? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, be- and I'm fortunate that one of my assistants, Macy played for me at Arizona state. And, and so her experience as a student athlete I think I'm a much better coach than when I coached her as on stage, but it, it, she has a, a somewhat of a, a grasp and understanding of, of what this, this looks like. And, and maybe as a student athlete, I don't understand the, the, the science and the podcast and everything that you listen to, to get to this point. But I think enjoyed that, that environment that we created. Um, uh, Lauren, who is our newest assistant on staff is, um, is someone that, that is and maybe had a little bit of the same experience at, at K-State with their, uh, with their coach, Susie Fritz, who is a good friend and a, a remarkable coach. And I was her assistant for a couple of years. And, um, and, um, and so you, you've got some people that came, come from, a, maybe this is the best way to, you want to put a staff together that maybe isn't always aligned, but is philosophically congruent. Um, you know, if we, were to bring somebody in that didn't think that you should teach people to play volleyball by playing volleyball, we'd have a hard time with it. Um, and then I, I, I really feel like my job is to share as much information and, and let's provide some educational opportunities for my staff so that they have a basis of understanding of where we're coming from. I need to be much better at that actually. Um, it's not that I'm hoarding information, it's just that I, I you know, listen to podcasts in the car and, uh, and, you know, make some notes and then move on with the rest of the day sort of thing. So I, I've got to be much better at sharing, but, um, but, but I think that's the case. And then we debrief. I think debriefing is a good idea. I think it's a good idea and I'm terrible at it, but I'm trying to get better at uh, debriefing with my athletes post-practice. I think there's some power in talking about practice and, and what it was that they felt. I think, uh, Lauren is, uh, really good at that. She's really good at, at that debrief and I'm terrible at it. Um, cause practice is over and I just want to go watch film of me not coaching. Right. Cause all I'm doing is talking, uh, uh, but Lauren's really good at that. So we've put her in charge of the debrief. Um, and then we debrief as a staff. We don't have a lot of formal meetings, but we do talk a lot throughout the course of the day. And our office situation is set up that we can do that. 
Um, so we talk a lot, but it's not really structured. Um, uh, we, I think we have structured meetings because we think we have to, um, uh, for no other reason, but we get, we talk a lot, but, uh, and, and ask questions and do some things. And, um, so I think that's how we get to where it is that the end game is that you're talking about. Yeah, that's really good. Debrief, reflection, just evaluating what happened. Would you tell me a little bit more about what your assistant is doing in those debriefs with the team at the end of practice? Yeah, I mean, it, it's an upgrade that uh, we're making for the fall. We, we didn't do a great job of it in the, in the, in the spring. We didn't debrief after every practice. We would debrief. Uh, one day a week, and um, but I think the direction that that we want to go is uh, you know providing uh, some mental performance, um, you know, feedback. Uh, hey, how did you do with this mental performance piece of it? Uh, um, the other part is you know, we're not big into stretching, but if you think it's noise too. Um, but maybe stretching at the end of practice so that we can go debrief with an athlete individual like, hey, Luke, really like the job that you did today on this particular particular. Scale. How did you feel like you did on that sort of thing? And so we can we can debrief with them uh, individually as they're circling up and stretching. And then then Lauren's going to take us through some, hey, you know, you guys, hey, here's a mental performance thing that that we're trying to put in place that and give us some feedback on on that. Um, uh, we also, at the beginning of practice, uh, athletes come in and write down uh, one, uh, we stole it uh, from the little book of talent, uh, smallest achievable perfection, SAP. And um, so today in practice, what is your smallest achievable perfection that you want? And they write one thing on the whiteboard and, and we can circle back around with them in the debrief on like, hey, how did you feel like you did on that, that one thing? And, and so that's where Lauren is, is trending with that sort of thing. You know, like, let's, let's keep track of these smallest achievable perfections. Let's make sure that they're not the same over the course of the entire season. Um, and, uh, and then let's track and debrief with them at the end of practice on those particular things. So, um, so I think that's where we're trending. But that's an area that where, like I said, I'm terrible at it. Uh, and uh, I've turned it over to Lauren to run with fully support. And I think that's a good thing to do with your assistants too. You know, you've got to give them an enormous amount of autonomy too. Um, uh, that's important as well. Um, you know, if you're an assistant and you don't have some autonomy over some things then then it gets to be a real, uh, and not all assistants want autonomy, you know, with autonomy comes some accountability too. And not everybody wants that, but, um, but yeah. So she's really good at that stuff. I'm, we're lucky to have her and Macy. I think they're, this is a good staff that we have at Arkansas. That's awesome. You know, I just actually released an episode with a guy named JP Nurbin and he talked about just a reflection kind of process that he's used with teams and with himself um, that I think you would really enjoy. So if you get a chance, I think you'd really, really enjoy listening to that one because he, he just kind of has like a really simple system and framework that he has used and used with teams. And I'm going to try to remember it off the top of my head, but really it's all about like reflect on yourself first. And then um, for players, it was like reflect on yourself first, then like a reflection on coaches and then a reflection on the team and just kind of going through that each day um, based on kind of some predetermined success criteria that everyone is aware of. It's like, Hey, this is what I'm going for today. Or this is what the coaches are going for today. This is what we're going for today as a team. And then at the end, circling back to that and saying, you know, everyone individually reflecting, okay, did I hit my success criteria today? Okay. How did, how did coach do hitting his success criteria? How did the team do hitting our success criteria? And just kind of like systematizing it almost like that in a way that, yeah, becomes routine and, like you talked about is just a way that we can actually debrief and reflect and, and hopefully improve by doing that. I'll, I'll add that to the, to the list of, uh, of uh, podcasts that I'll, I'll listen to. Um, 
you know, you live in Fayetteville, so you know my commute to work isn't very long. So yeah. it probably takes me three days to get through a podcast, but uh, I'm gonna I make my way through. Yeah, absolutely. Well, here's here's my last question, and then I've got a, a couple of rapid fire questions for you. You talked about it briefly towards the beginning. Just tell me your thoughts about the importance of how coaches respond to mistakes and errors by players. So, yeah, it, it, I'm fascinated with errors. Um, and um, I've taken a couple of motor learning classes, but I took one here at Arkansas as I was getting my master's. And um, there was a section on there about errors. And, and I'd, I'd been, you know, there's all of the, you know, hey, the faster you fail, the faster you learn. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of people that are talking about errors. Errors are good, things like that. And, and I think that's true, but part that didn't resonate with me is, you know, are all errors equal? You know, is the cause of the error the same, you know? And, and I get a little frustrated when, you know, we, athletes are making errors and we, we tell them, well, they're not paying attention or, you know, they just don't want it or, or something like that. And, and that's really not the case. So one of the things you have to ask yourself as a coach is, you know, here's this error and it's not the end of the world, you know, uh, but what's causing the error? And it may not be what you think it is. You know, it may not be that this error is the result of this athlete not paying attention. It could be that they're not paying attention or they're not paying attention to the right things at the right time. That very well could be. And that's different. That's different. It, the athletes aren't making errors because they're indifferent to the outcome. They're making errors because, uh, you know, maybe they're not physically ready to play at that level, you know, the, the yet, you know, and, uh, and then maybe they don't understand the requirements of this particular activity. Um, and so there's lots of reasons that, that athletes are making errors. Maybe they just made the wrong decision at that particular time, you know, and you caught it because it's an error as a coach, you know, and, and, but they've been making this wrong selection for the longest period of time. And, and, you know, now you have a window into trying to go, go solve it. So I, I think once you start looking at errors in a different lens where it's not, you know, just, Hey, here's an error because of, you know, what, whatever. And, 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 the, and, you know, well, you know, what if they keep making the same error over and over and over again, you know, well, then that's on you as the coach. That's not on the athlete. It's not like, uh, I'd be very surprised if any athlete came to practice and their SAP for that day, the smallest achievable perfection of that day is make as many errors as I possibly could so that my coach yelled at me. Like that's not what they come to practice to, to do. Um, they're coming to practice to try and go get better and understanding that it's a pretty vulnerable environment. And so you have to understand that not all errors are the cause of, of attention. You know, they, they may have picked the wrong solution for that particular thing. So let's guide them into a better solution. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm fascinated with, with, with errors. When I see them occur in my, my practice, my first response is, I wonder why that happened. And, um, and if it's just one, then let it be, right? Let, let's let it be. But if it happens again and then again, then it's like, okay, now maybe it's time for me to, um, maybe now it's time for me to say, hey, what are you working on there? And how can I help? You know, and, you know, hey, what did you see? What did you do? You know, and, and do that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, let's not paint all areas with the same paintbrush. It, it just isn't, it isn't fair to the athletes. And again, I've said it more times than not, it hinders learning. It really hinders learning. And yeah. Yeah. And to connect back to the very first thing you said, we have to be empathetic. We have to remember what it's like to be an athlete and to know they're not out there trying to make mistakes. They're not like telling them the obvious that 
you know, you had a bad hit or you made this mistake. Like that doesn't do any good. Help them solve the problems that are in front of them. That's yeah. it's such a huge shift. And uh, I'll also, I'll also add that, you know, any coach that at one upon a time was a player is never as good as what they remember themselves as, you know, like you were making those same mistakes at the same time, at some point in time in your career. And, um, and so, I mean, I always, that, 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 I met, that makes me laugh, you know, well, when I was, yeah, who cares? No, none of these kids care what you were doing when you were playing. They don't care. You know, um, it's, it's about what you're helping them do now rather than what you did when you were playing, you know, so, um, you know, back in my day. Uh, okay, fine. <laughs> That's good. Here are my rapid fire questions for you. Here's the oh, first boy. one. The most fun part of coaching is practice. Agreed. Uh, yeah. I'm, the games are for the athletes. The games are not for me. Um, but, but practice, I love practice. I love it. I know I'm successful as a coach when. Uh, yeah. When I see my athletes uh, embrace competition, when I see my athletes uh, embrace relationships and have uh, meaningful discussions, uh, I think that's a pretty telling sign that we're, we're making progress. That's good. Here's my next one. And it's kind of, we've talked about some of this kind of throughout, but maybe a, the, the number one thing that comes to your mind. I wish I would have known blank before my first coaching experience. I wish I would have known more about feedback and uh, that, that not all feedback is meaningful and probably you should spend more time shutting up than, than, than providing meaningless feedback. That's good. Here's the last one. If you could decide these are the top three things every coach should be educated on, what would they be? Ooh, three things. Um, specificity. I think specificity is huge. Um, uh, and we've talked about how the game, you know, playing the game. I think specificity is huge. Um, uh, I think to the importance of uh relationships uh and uh and and building those uh relationships uh your athletes aren't searching for for you to be their friend um they, they have friends um uh but what they are searching searching for is uh somebody that's going to provide them uh support and encouragement and uh and put them in a great environment to succeed so i think that's uh that's that's important and i think the third thing is maybe it falls in line with the question or, or not is that this journey never ends like you never arrive um and uh you know you have to keep learning and uh so maybe you've got to create some humility no matter how much success you have um you've got to keep learning and evolving and growing uh, because you're asking the same of your athletes every day in practice. So you should reciprocate in kind. Yeah, that's really powerful. It's a great list. Uh, well, coach, this has been incredible. It's been awesome. Before we hop off, just share with people where they can connect with you. Yeah. So I'm not as uh, surprisingly, I'm not as proficient as social media as some uh, people, but I have a Twitter account. Um, but uh, what I do know is if you email me, um, and my email address is this strange email address. It's uh, jmw076 at uark.edu. If you email me with questions and stuff like that, uh, I'll send you my cell phone number and we can chat. Uh, I'd love, uh, people don't take us up on that, maybe because we're not interesting, but um, uh, yeah, you can text. I, I have coaches text me and we get involved in conversations um, and uh, we really like it. Um, and um, we're, we're really wanting to engage with coaches on, on different things. And, uh, but I don't have a, a, I don't have what you have. I don't have this podcast or this 
website or anything like that. But um, but uh, we're never too busy to talk uh, volleyball and we're never too busy to talk about uh, coaching. And, uh, and so I really appreciate you giving me some time here. This is fun. This is fun. Yeah, for me to do. absolutely. It's been awesome. Thanks a ton for joining me. Yeah. I wish you all the best with your, uh, with your, with your platform. Coaches, thanks for listening to this episode, and thanks again to Coach Watson for coming out of the podcast. As always, if you'd like to get a free copy of the notes from this episode, you can get a free eight-page PDF at coachesclubpod.com. And as I said in the intro, this conversation left a lasting impression on me. I found the idea of being both good to and good for our athletes so simple, yet so profound and impactful. It's a phrase that has continued to go through my head long after I talked with Coach Watson. So that's my challenge to us. How can we grow in these two areas? Good too, being how we build relationships with and treat our athletes. And good for, being how we help them improve and grow both as athletes and as people. I also just want to take a minute to say thank you to you, the listeners. When I started this podcast, I didn't really know what to expect, but the most rewarding part has been having opportunities to connect with the coaches that are listening and hearing how these conversations have impacted your coaching. So thanks. Thanks for listening and sharing. And most importantly, thanks for being a coach that's committed to growing so that you can better serve your athletes. That's what it's all about. Being both good to and good for our athletes. Thanks for listening to the Coaches Club podcast powered by Transform Sport, where we believe great coaches transform lives, athletes deserve great coaches, and coaches deserve great training. 